I pay my thanks to United States Institute of Peace and its president, executive president, and my brother, Dr. Kamarul Huda, and all audience who are joining me in this session. I would like to start my talk from the first point, and that is the concept of jihad. <clears throat> there are certain terms, certain words which have been hijacked by the extremists and terrorists and they misinterpret them and try to radicalize the Muslim youth in particular and other Muslims in general through radicalistic and extremistic wrong interpretation of those concepts and wrong interpretation of some of the verses of Quran and traditions of the Holy Prophet taking them out of the context and misusing and misapplying them. That's why <clears throat> through their efforts the youth who are accessible to them or do are those who are influenced by them they try that they may parrot some verses and some uh, some traditions and they may frequently use some words of jihad of martyrdom of khilafa of Islam, Darul Harb, Darul Islam, these kind of terms. Putting them together, then they have developed an ideology with a wrong claim that this ideology is Islam or this originates from the text of Quran or text of the tradition of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So crux of our talk today is that this claim is totally a wrong accusation against Islam. This is baseless and this ideology of terrorists and extremists has absolutely no link, and no connection, no legitimacy with Islam and Islamic teachings and the classical interpretations of Islamic authorities. <coughs> After this brief introductory talk, I would like to, I don't like to go into the matters which are commonly known, and I would be leaving certain things for you, taking the concept of jihad. When this word is uttered, or it is heard, an image of killing, fighting, <clears throat> combating, automatically because of their wrong activities and wrong interpretations. This image emerges in the minds. <clears throat> My first point which I am going to elaborate is that the word jihad and the term jihad does not include any kind of meaning of killing or torturing or fighting or combating. This world is free from these meanings. It means just an extreme exertion, effort, struggle for any good cause. If we go into the Quranic studies, we find there are 35 verses of Holy Quran in total which include the commandment of jihad or the world of jihad in any form of its derivatives. <clears throat> it can be jahada, it can be jahid, it can be jahada, it can be yujahidun, any derivative. There are a total of 35 verses which include the commands of jihad, commandments of jihad. 
So out of these 35 verses, 31 verses have absolutely no mentioning of fighting anywhere. I mean neither in the text nor in the context. There are three ways of determining the meaning or implication or significance of a particular commandment through a verse. Either you understand some commandment or teaching or injunction through the text of the verse, or you try to understand that concept through the context, or you try to understand sometimes through historical context. Which were, what were the historical circumstances when this commandment was revealed? At what time, which date, what year, in which particular situation, and what was the intention? So historical background. Text, context, or historical background. 31 verses out of 35 which mention the commandment of jihad, they have no mentioning directly or indirectly, no mentioning of fighting and combating. Even I am talking of a defensive warfare or a lawful and just war, no, absolutely there is no mentioning of fighting either. Number two, I would like to explain one thing even before this point keeping in mind and that is that there is not a single verse in Holy Quran starting from the first chapter ending up to the last chapter of Vannas, Al-Fatiha to Vannas. I have not been able to find a single verse in the Holy Quran where self-defense was prohibited, taking up arms was prohibited. Standing up for your own resistance against oppression was prohibited. There was no permission for self-defense. Even at that particular time, the verses of jihad were there. I would just quote the reference for your further studies. <clears throat> Those verses which were revealed in Holy Quran in Meccan time is one of them is Al-Furqan Surah, verse number 52. Second Surah An-Kabut, verse 6. Third again Surah Al-An-Kabut, verse 8. Surah Al-An-Kabut, verse 69. And chapter Luqman, verse 15. I just quote as a sample, one or two out of them. Holy Quran says, وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ and it was stated, hum bihi jihadan kabira. You should perform a very big jihad. So performance of very big jihad, a great jihad. This was commanded by Almighty God in Makkah when Muslims were not allowed to touch any arm or they were not allowed to stand up for their self-defense or they were not allowed to resistance against oppression. Even then the commandments of great jihad were there in Makkah. This is an evidence more than enough and very ample evidence to establish the fact that jihad does not necessarily include even the war of defense. Although it is included in the, the broader term of jihad, but it does not necessarily mean jihad was revealed much more earlier than the command of the permission of self-defense war and the lawful defensive wars were granted. So, if this is the case, then we have to understand, then what does jihad mean when this was the commandment in Meccan period where your resistance against oppression was prohibited and you were not allowed to raise the arms? So what was the meaning of jihad in Quran? And what does the same meaning will continue till today? So jihad has, as far as its meanings are concerned, it has five dimensions of its meaning. The first meaning, and that is the greatest of the jihad actions, the great jihad, the biggest jihad, it has spiritual dimension. The jihad has its spiritual dimension. It is known as jihad bin nafs, and that is your struggle for self-purification 
against your, it is a fight against your uh, evil wishes of your lower self to purify your inner self, to make a person a good moral and ethical personality who could work for the sake of Allah, who could be get rid of arrogance, of greed, of lies, of uh, aggressions, aggressive attitudes, negative propensities, and who could work for the betterment of humanity and the society, and for himself too. This is purely spiritual dimension, no link with arms. Second dimension of its meaning is intellectual dimension, academic and intellectual. In intellectual dimension of jihad, the word ijtihad has emerged. And ijtihad, and mujtahid is a scholar, is a great jurist, an expert of juristic sciences who can derive and deduct the legal values and meanings from the old bases and who can apply according to the changing and newly emerging situations of modern times. So mujtahid and ishtihad from jihad means connecting the old with the past with the future through academic and intellectual and juristic efforts, purely an academic and juristic work. It is jihad bil ilm and jihad bil fiqh. Third is social dimension and this is jihad bil amal. This can be political this can be social, this can be cultural, this can be educational. Anyway, this is for the social reforms of the society to purify the society from social evils, to eradicate the corruption from the society. And all kind of evil <coughs> attitudes of human behavior individually at first level and collectively at this third level so these works of social reforms and political reform, democratic struggles, political struggles, peaceful struggles, all come within the range of uh, ambit of jihad bil qawl, al amr bil maruf wa nahi anil munkar, to promote the good and to abstain from evils. <laughs> this is social dimension. Third is jihad bil mal. It is financial dimension of the world jihad, concept jihad. This is just an act of charity. And Quran has emphasized on particularly two areas of jihad. The first jihad bin nafs, the, spirit, the, 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 the purification of self, lower self, spiritual one, and the socio-economic one, the financial. Most emphasis in Quran has been given on these two. And there is a full-fledged surah, a chapter of Quran, which explains this concept and it is said that even negation of act of charity is negation of deen, of wholesome of the deen. Spending the money to remove economic deadlock of the poor, spending your own economic resources to provide the facility to alleviate the poverty from the society, the work which is being done by the charitable organizations in the western countries, the Muslim countries, by the UNO, whatever, to help humanity out and take it out from the financial crisis for struggle for equitable distribution of wealth and to provide them all facilities and privileges of the life as human beings. This is jihad. So Quran says, Have you seen a person, O oh Holy Prophet, have you seen the person who totally rejects deen of Islam? The rejecter or nullifier of the deen. Have you seen that person? Then Quran answers. The, the person who nullifies, the person who rejects the deen, religion of Islam, is the one who does not do anything for the betterment, betterment of orphans, who does not provide food to the orphans, who does not work to alleviate the poverty in the life of the poor, yatama and masakin, the orphans and the poor communities. Those people who do not work for their economic betterment and welfare, these are the people who are nullifier or rejecter of the faith. So this act of charity, jihad, this is jihad bil mal. This is one of the best jihads. And the fourth, fifth dimension is the defensive dimension. 
fifth one. Only that is the defensive dimension. Where if you are attacked, and uh, of course no need to explain it, then there is a bar of self-defense, a defensive bar. As a student of law, and as a humble student of international law, I can uh, say this, declare this fact with full confidence that as far as my studies throughout my life are concerned, I have not seen a minor difference between the definition of a lawful war or jihad or qital, just war, which is known as qital. According to Islam, and the definitions and conditions given by the UN Charter. It is exactly the same concept, same definition with same conditions. No difference in... The only difference is the term, the word, the jihad or qital is the word in Arabic language and we say just wars and lawful wars right from the time of Aristotle till today as UN know, Charter's time. Throughout the history, concept of just wars and lawful wars has been existing continuously in every era of human history. The same is the concept now, according to Islam. This is, we will come to that, but this is the defensive dimension of jihad. When Holy Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, two verses were revealed in order to provide the permission of lawful self-defense war. Lawful and just defensive wars, two verses. First was revealed in first year of migration. So these are two where the commandments of fighting are available. The basic commandments remaining are uh, addition to that, further explanation, further interpretation. They are further clauses. Basic two articles <coughs> which provide the permission of fighting. One is in Surah Al-Hajj, verse number 39, and chapter number 22. Chapter 22, verse 39. The words are, Uzina lilladheena yuqataluna bi'annahum zulimu. It is stated that now the permission is granted to take up the arms and to fight those who have already imposed war on you. Because you have been wronged, you have been oppressed, because an act of aggression has been committed to you. So now today the permission of armed resistance for your self-defense is given to you. This is the first verse. Look into the words. Uzina, permission is granted. Lillazina, only to those yukataluna against whom an aggression and war has been already imposed. And why? Because they have been an act of aggression, an act of militancy, act of terrorism, act of killing, act of attack has been already committed on them. So now they can resist to, for their self-defense. This is the foundational article of jihad in the meaning of qital, I mean the self-defense, not the Four meanings I have already explained. This was the first year of Hijra. Because the state had come into existence. This is a very interesting point which I would elaborate here. And uh, maybe very few scholars would have mentioned this. But I have not seen in any book any scholar. This is a very significant point. Since when Holy Prophet was in Mecca, there was no Islamic state there. That's why nobody was allowed to stood up with arm for armed conflict to resist with arms. When he migrated to Medina, Islamic State came into existence. He was head of the state through the constitution when he made the alliance with the Jewish tribes and their allies and he, be, he was selected or appointed as the head of the, uh, of the state and a constitution of Medina was given. a sahifa first constitution. Since he was the head of the state and state was already in power, that's why standing up for resistance against the oppression was allowed and defensive war was allowed because state was already there. So this difference of Meccan and Medinan period explains the fact that in any case, even if it is defensive war, no person as individual, no community 
collectively. No organization, not a community. On their own, they cannot even wage a defensive war. War is a privilege or prerogative or a lawful right of the state. No organization, no, no person has an authority or privilege to wage wars and declare its, act, its a terroristic acts as jihad. So it was not done by Holy Prophet and his companions. How can it be legalized or it can be legitimate for organization existing nowadays, claiming their criminalistic and terroristic activities as jihad? This is totally against the teachings and the practice and conduct of Holy Prophet. Second verse was revealed, which is the foundational, second article, foundational article of jihad in the meaning of qital, the word qital, lawful, just, defensive war. And that was again in Surah Al-Baqarah, this is Medinan chapter, verse number 190. Al-Baqarah chapter number is 2, to verse number 190. Again, we can ponder into the words. The words are waqatilu, sometimes the people, they just take a few words from a verse. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they take the verse out of the context and they use specific words for their own meanings. There may be some Muslim terrorists or there may be some of the Western scholars or Orientalists who have not full grasp and comprehension on the subject. Both sides. So Quran says, waqatilu fi sabilillah alladhina yuqatilunakum وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ This is the second foundation, two verses. Quran says, this was revealed in seventh year of migration. It means, now already 20 years had passed after the promulgation of Islam and after the announcement of his prophet, pronouncement of his prophethood and after the starting of the commencement of revolution of Quran. 13 years of Meccan, 7 years of Medinan period, 20 years had passed when the command of defensive war was revealed. Only 3 years of, were left of Holy Prophet's life. Command for defensive war. And this was revealed with a particular historical context. I will come to that, inshallah, quickly. When the treaty of peace was breached by the Meccans, only as a result of the breach of treaty of peace, Treaty of Hudabiya, which was a 10 years agreement of no war, 10 years no war pact, was done and signed by the Meccans and Medinans, by Yodi Prophet. And the Meccans breached that treaty of peace within one year. This was the historical background when war of defense was allowed for the Muslims as a state. And whenever there was a war of defense, it was fought by the state. It was between state to state. And another point very significant which we need to keep in our mind is that all more than 60 wars or fights or military expedi expeditions were taken up where the Med Medinan, Medinan states or the Muslims, they participated in wars, but none of them was in advance. None of them was in offensive. All wars were fought against Medinan state and prophet of Medina, mostly on the border of Medina, and always holy prophet of Islam and his companions and Muslim army was on defensive. The very first war of Badr was fought near Medina. He was on defensive. Second war in second year was fought on the border of Medina. Even now, Uhud is two years away from the holy mosque, city of downtown of Medina on the border. Third war of trench was fought on the border of Medina when the Meccan army was about to enter into Medina and Holy Prophet and companions dug a trench to stop their entry. So all of the wars, Ahzab, were fought on the borders of Medina. Even as a self-defense or as a preemptive war in defense where it was clear the certain tribe was about to attack on Medina. So he fought again for defense as a preemption when it was very clear that they are being under attack. So these are all the provisions which are authorized by UN Charter. Authorized by UN Charter. So this verse was revealed in seventh year of Hijrah where it stated, you may fight 
in the way of Allah. The word in the way of Allah is misused, misinterpreted or exploited. When it is said, Fi sabilillah, in the way of Allah, it means just cause. Just for good cause. Not for expansionistic uh, objectives. Just for Allah's player, for just cause. And you, you may fight those allazina yuqatilunakum, those who are already fighting against you, those who have already imposed a war on you. So fight in defense. Wala ta'atadu. Even in war of defense, you are not allowed to transgress the limits. Transgression is prohibited. The transgression means even during the warfare in the battlefield, during the warfare, you can't kill the women. This is a categorical in Bukhari, Muslim, and hundreds of the books of Hadith and traditions. I have mentioned all these references in my books, in my fatwa, verdict, everywhere. No need to refer it again. So women are totally prohibited. You can't kill the women during the warfare. You can't kill the children. You can't kill the kids. You can't kill the priests, pastors, bishops, religious leaders of the Jewish or, or Christian or other faith. You can't kill the farmers. You can't kill the agriculturists, the farmers, the growers. You can't kill the business community because they provide economy, livelihood to the society. You can't kill the traders. You can't kill diplomats and envoys and ambassadors. These are categorical injunctions of Holy Prophet, not only in one single book, in hundreds of the books, in hundreds of ahadiths, and the classical literature is full of these references. And the same was the practice of the guided caliphs in the time and afterwards, in the Khilafat Rashida and afterwards. You can't demolish the churches. You can't demolish the, the houses. You can't burn the trees. You can't kill the animals without except the need of food. Even during warfare in the land of your enemy, you can't demolish, you can't attack on civilian population. You can't attack on non-combatants. These are the rules of lawful warfare, lawful jihad. You can't attack the civil. So if the Holy Prophet and all the four guided caliphs and Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet and all classical authorities without any dispute in 1400 years, whether they are Hanafis or Malikis or Shafi or Hanbalis or Jafaris, there is no dispute on this point. So no one is allowed to attack on non-combatant, even during the warfare. With the state of war, the non-combatant civilian population belonging to a state or country which you are fighting or they are fighting on you. Even then you are not allowed to, to kill them. So what, where does we get place for the suicide bombings on civilian population? And the terroristic attacks on the civilian population and attacks on the night times and on twin towers and on embassies and everywhere and kidnapping them and killing them. All these acts are just Criminal acts, anti-Islamic acts, anti-Quranic acts, but they have unfortunately hijacked and they create news and news make the minds. Then the views come on the news and these things make the mindset. So now coming to... So concluding this aspect, fighting in self-defense, or fighting against aggression and persecution. Another condition is very important, and that is that fighting, lawful fighting in defense should be in a just proportion. La ta'atadu. Proportionality. You can't transgress the limits. There should be a just proportionality and a moral conduct of war, as I mentioned some of the things. Categorical letters and, and instructions were issued in written form by Holy Prophet and the Caliphs. But these things are prohibited. You can't do that. And fighting for restoration of peace and harmony. And in spite of the war, lawful warfare, the truths and treaties of peace are to be honored. The Muslims were and are, according to Quran and Sunnah, not allowed to break or to breach the truths or treaty of peace. In any case, These were the main conditions. Now, where this mentality has come from, this mentality, terrorist mentality, 
I have mentioned in my fatwa, in my edict, and it is very clear, <coughs> a very significant aspect that this is not Islamic mentality. This is Kharijait mentality. Of terrorism is just a legacy, a continuity of Kharijait. Who were Kharijaites? Briefly speaking, that was the first terrorist group emerged in the history of Islam in the period of fourth guided caliph Sayyidina Ali. The fourth guided caliph in, during his caliphate, Sayyidina Ali. The first terrorist group, they took up the arms and raised a slogan, La hukma illa lillah. We want the rule of God on the earth. Same is the slogan being raised now. We want to establish a caliphate worldwide. We want to establish the rule of God. We want to establish the command of Quran. The whole democratic world, Western world, Muslim countries, they are following the West. All these are kafir. So, La Hukma Illa Lillah was the slogan given by Kharijites. And holy, there I have compiled a book on, of Hadith on Kharijites. And there are one more than 100 traditions of Holy Prophet. And all of them are very authentic, highly authentic. From Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmazi, Nasai, Ibn Majah, all six books. And majority of all those hadiths come from Bukhari, Muslim, Muttafaqala, unanimously agreed upon. No weeks uh, rank. Holy Prophet declared these Kharijites that they would be out of the ambit of Islam. He declared clearly they would go out of the ambit of Islam. They would have no link with my ummah and my religion. And I would have no link with them. And Holy Prophet mentioned specific signs of Kharijait terrorists. I would like to mention a few so that the case comes clear in our mind. I will just mention the signs. With all references are in Bukhari and Muslim. And Abu Dawood and Sunan Tirmazi and Nasai Siha Sitta, the six highest ranking books of Hadith, and particularly Bukhari Muslim, Muttafaqale, agreed upon. The first sign given by Holy Prophet about the Kharijite terrorists and companions fought them. They terminated them. The first war of terror was fought by Islam against terrorists. First war of terror. And it continued in first two centuries. In first two centuries. But it started in the days of Sayyidina Ali, the fourth guided caliph. So, so war of terror against the terrorists is a continuity of Islamic teachings, Islamic injunctions. This is what Holy Prophet has commanded. Signs were given. Number one, Holy Prophet said, they will be young in age. The terrorists, Kharijai terrorists. You can see, whenever you catch them, they are youth. Ahdathul Asnan. It is in Bukhari Muslim. No need to quote references again. I have explained. 98% all of these signs are from Bukhari and Muslim. Muttafaqaleh. They would be young in age. Ahdasul Asnan are the words of Holy Prophet. Number two. They will be brainwashed. Sufahaul Ahlam. The second term has been used by Holy Prophet. You see how prophecies of Holy Prophet are applied correctly and truly in today's heart. Number third, Holy Prophet said they will have thick unkept beards. Bulky, thick unkept beards. Kasul Lehya. They will wear their lower garments high upon their legs. Mushammirul Izar. So these terms indicate their extreme religiosity. They will seem extremely religious in their appearance. In the recitation of Quran, in their praying, in their slogans. And Holy Prophet said they will emerge from the East. I am just giving the text. No need of any interpretation. They will emerge from the east. Yakhrujunasun min qibal al mashriq. They will emerge from the east. This is again in Bukhari and Muslim. And then Holy Prophet said that the faith will go out of they will go out of the ambit of faith and Islam. And they will very extreme in practice of religions and slogans of religions. Yatamakuna wa yatashadduna fiddin tashadud extremism. In deen. They will be extremists. The word tashaddud, extremism, has been used in the hadith of Holy Prophet. 
and holy prophet said they will quote quran and they will think as if these verses are revealed in their favor but in reality these verses would be against them evidences against them then holy prophet said yaquluna min ahsan an-nas qawla yaquluna min qawli khair al-bariya their slogans will seem very impressive and very popular or attractive to a common muslim same is happening today they speak in a way a common muslim is influenced muslim governments are doing nothing we are being wronged governments are not taking care of the muslim community so the aggression act of aggression is being committed against us in these 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 parts of the world so we are under obligation the burden comes on our shoulder to stand up and defend islam and defend the muslim community very beautiful words beautiful appealing sentences and slogans this is what holy prophet said their slogans their talk their speech would appeal common people they will refer from quran and hadith but the wrong references and holy prophet said they will speak good things but they would be the the worst cree of the whole creation sharrul khalq wal khaliqa holy pe hum sharrul khalq wal khaliqa and holy prophet said then they will kill the people they will block the ways and roads they will kill the people they will murder the people they they will their practice would be the blood shedding so all these ahadith and holy prophet said fighting against them war against their terror anybody who participated fight against them would be rewarded on the day of judgment so war against terror is the sunnah of prophet muhammad peace be upon him and the sunnah of the companions and injunction of islam so one person one may say that these kharijites was a particular group which appeared in the days of the caliphate fourth caliph and they can say that they continued into first two centuries what is link of the two days terrorist with the kharijite philosophy or kharijite existence so that would be wrong holy prophet said they will keep on appearing and emerging throughout the history from time to time from century to century and holy prophet mentioned he said more than 20 times they will keep on whenever they will appear they would be cut off they would be terminated whenever they will appear in a particular time they would be terminated and he repeated the words he will said they will appear and emerge in the history more than 20 times and the last group of kharijite terrorist will appear with anti christ they would be the followers and they would be the friends and army of they will become army of anti christ the jal so they will keep on emerging in the history till anti christ appears in the world it mean till the day of judgment they will continue appearing so it means this is the textual connection of the uh, these uh, terrorists of today they are not only connected with the kharijites no they are actually kharijites legacy a continuity as holy prophet said that they will keep on emerging and emerging from time to time till the appearance of antichrist all scholars and jurists and authorities on aqeedah and faith and theology they have defined the world al khawarij kharijite including imam ajuri or sharistani in al miral wan nahl including allama ibn taymiyah including imam nabawi imam asqalani even up to the scholars of india old scholars allama shabir ahmad usmani all throughout the history they have been defining who the khawarij are they say that the kharijites are not to be confined with that particular historical group which appeared in the days of caliphate the fourth caliph no ashbahuhum all those people who believe in ideology of killing the mankind and considering they are killing lawful or those who fight against the governments and take up the arms and rebel against the states and they consider the bloodshed lawful for them because of their ideology those who think that we are here only to enforce the rule and command of god on the earth and then they kill the people considering licit all scholars say that all these people are kharijites so kharijite was not only a one group it is a continuum groups till the day of judgment now very important thing coming towards last two things briefly 
There is another confusion which is normally and frequently used by the terrorists, by the extremist people, and they quote a verse of Holy Quran from Suba Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 5. And the same verse creates some, has created some confusion in some Western authors and writers. And they say this is ayah to save the verse of sword. All those references, there were 70 to 120 verses banning taking up arms in Meccan period. When the permission of self-defense war came, self-defense and defense of, against your aggression and all these things, so the extremist people and the terrorists and some of the Western writers who are again confused and have no clarity on the subject, so they say that this verse, Surah at tawbah verse 5, Ayat to Saif, repealed all verses which were revealed for self-defense. And this was the verse just to kill the non-Muslims. And the terrorists of today, the Kharijai terrorists, they take wrong benefit and they exploit the meanings of this verse, take it out of the context, misinterpret it. So I want to clarify this misunderstanding from both sides, from the Muslim side and from the Western side. So now I am analyzing this verse of sword. Ayatul Saif. This verse is verse number 5 in chapter 9. So we have to be very clear that you can't, we can't segregate or isolate a particular verse taking out of the context and then interpreting it in a specific situation. No, we have to try to understand every single verse in the full context of Quran and in the historical background in which it was revealed. So this is a verse of chapter 9. This surah is known as Surah Al-Bara, Surah Bara'a, Surah to tawbah and Surah Bara. This is the chapter of renunciation, absolution. This was revealed in ninth year of Hijrah, ninth year of Holy Prophet's migration. That's why they say this was the last verses and they have repealed all verses of peace and commandments of treaties, and commandments of self-defense, it has become an absolute mandatory on the Muslims, Mazallah, Astaghfirullah, wrongly saying, just to kill the non This is the biggest silly thing to say. The, ter the, ter the, the terrorists are using this word. Biggest silly argument of the terrorist, terrorists. This whole chapter was revealed in ninth year of migration. And is the first word is that the treaty of peace which was made in Hudaybiyah in 6th of Hijrah, when Holy Prophet went there with 1,500 companions, and he was not allowed to enter Makkah. And this situation ended up on a treaty of peace, a truce for 10 years. No war truce. So there was a specific condition, article in that treaty, written article, that neither Makkah nor Medina would attack on each other, nor their allies. And None of these two states, Makkah or Medina, would be allowed to help any ally in order to attack on Medina or attack on the allies of Medina. The same way, Medina would not be allowed to help their ally in order to attack any ally of Mecca. So this was the comprehensive treaty for 10 years, no war. What happened soon after this treaty took place, one year before, there were, Banu Bakr was a very big tribe, among the allies of Meccans. And there was a big tribe, Banu Khuza'a. He was allies of Medinans, Medina. So Banu Bakr attacked, breaching the Treaty of Peace, Banu Bakr attacked on Banu Khuza'a and committed an, a, a grave act of killing, massacre, public massacre, mass killing in Mecca. And Meccans provided them the arms, the money, and they physically participated in this attack and killing. So the Meccans breached the Treaty of Peace by this attack and a collective act of killing of tribe Banu Khuza'a. So the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was breached, finished. This surah, chapter 9, was revealed in this context, historical context to announce up till this time, the breach of treaty has, was done by the Meccans. Now, Quran is declaring annulment or renunciation that treaty of peace which was done in Hudaybiyah. 
under which both sides were bound and responsible not to wage war against each other or against their allies now baraatum min allah wa rasuluh god and his prophet are announcing that that treaty has been renunciated cancelled now there is no liability on both sides this is an announcement of no liability is remaining after the breach has taken place by the meccans this was the whole surah number 2 next verse important is adhanum min allah wa rasul second verse i will come to verse number 5 adhanum min allah wa rasul then holy god commanded holy prophet since the treaty has been breached so there should be no warfare unless it should be properly publicly announced so second verse and third verse they include the public announcement of the breach of treaty and the both parties have come out of their responsibility because of the meccans tree tree breach of treaty second is azanum min allah wa rasul so it is announced that the treaty is now no more in existence after this the next thing which was done that is verse number 4 and it is stated verse number 4 that those who have breached the treaty but still there are some tribes they were allied allies of meccans they have not yet breached their allies so quran says illa allazina ahattu min almushrikeen they are allies those allies who have not participated in the breach so the treaty of peace would remain intact and applicable as far as those tribes are concerned because they are peace loving tribes so madina will honor that treaty for them this was the third article then fourth article was only those meccans and allies who initiated the war against madina and medinan allies since they particularly they have breached the treaty so this an renunciation and annulment of treaty would affect only their position no would be they were no more under guarantee because they have breached article number 4 and 5 there an ultimatum was given even after breach of trust ke we will not fight against you in spite of your breach four month ultimatum was given faizan salakh al ashhur al hurum and in quran it comes minha arbaat al hurum four months were given to them as ultimatum in the same way as un no gives ultimatum to iraq and many other countries those who breach abuse human rights and violate the treaties of peace ultimatum for four months was given and stated we are giving you the month period of four months so that you may come back to peace again you may restore the peace you may revise your policy if the treaty of peace is restored and policy of peace is again made so these are four months are given for peace making there would be no war and even after four months if you don't revise the policy and still you prepare attacking on us then this was verse number 5 the verse of sword the king this was revealed then you are allowed to fight them as a defensive war and this was again as a defensive war and some people among the terrorists they think and some misunderstanding is in the west they think as if this verse repealed all verses which were uh, communicated before that is wrong this verse did not repeal any verse this verse just repealed the treaties which were already breached by the meccans this was the abrogator or repealer of the treaties between medina and makka and this was not repealer of the verses all commandments of quran remained the same for defensive war entering into and this is reported by abdullah ibn abbas says the same thing adhaq bin muzahim says the same thing ali bin abi talha says the same thing that even they say this verse of sword elaborates that you cannot take the sword up against those people who have not breached the the treaty of peace so it was still for those who are peace loving countries and those who are not going to attack you you can't war any kind of you can't fight them in your defense and again if there a war is going on the same verse told tells in verse number 6 if a war is going on and a state of war is restored even during warfare during warfare it is said if any person non combatant belonging to a state 
विच यू आर फाइटिंग विच इज फाइटिंग यू इफ दैट नॉन कंबेटेंट कम्स टू यू यू आर अंडर एन ऑब्लीगेशन टू प्रोवाइड पीस एंड सिक्योरिटी टू हिम वर्स नंबर सिक्स सुन आफ्टर इमीजिएटली आफ्टर द वर्स फर्स्ट वर्स फाइव सेड दैट यू आर अंडर एन ऑब्लीगेशन टू प्रोवाइड सेफ्टी एंड सिक्योरिटी टू ऑल नॉन कंबेटेंट्स सो दिस इज द कुरानिक एक्सप्लिसिट कमांडमेंट to provide safety and security to all non combatants when and quran and up to verse number 12 again said only fight them who commit aggression on you who fight you who impose war on you except those people who stick to their agreement of peace don't fight them this is verse number 12 of the same chapter so this was an analysis of the whole subject of the verse of uh, uh, known as verse of sword in the just within one minute now after exploiting all these concepts the last point which is being misused and wrongly interpreted by misusing and hijacking the concept of jihad and all these they what do they say they declare the whole world as darul harb a board of war and they say we are under obligation to fight them irrespective muslim non muslim america us every they say it's a board of war this is against quran and sunnah the basic relationship between the muslim countries and non muslim countries is not the relationship of war it is the relationship of neutrality whole world originally on the basic original relationship with muslim countries are neutral countries these are known as a board of neutrality darul hayad relationship of al muhayada neutrality if they fight you they become a board of war directly military to military not the society if they enter into a treaty of peace they become darul ahad a board of treaty if they establish a friendly relation with you and made an agreement conciliation of stopping the war they become darul sulh a board of conciliation and by this way today you and no has taken place of all these quranic commandments because of a multi national treaty through you and no every state every single member of you and no has entered into a multinational international treaty of peace you and no has become the treaty maker peace maker for the whole world so every single country muslim or non muslim is bound according to the un charter so all countries of the world are become darul ahad under you and no and the injunctions of quran and sunnah and islam of darul ahad are same as darul islam and uh, as as ending remarks all jurists imam abu hanifa imam tahawi imam sarakhsi imam kasani and imam and hambali and shafi and maliki scholars even imam shafi they agreed on this idea that the world darul islam does not mean the land of islam or abode of islam this is wrong translation darul islam means abode of peace and every country where the people living there are free in they have security of life of property of wealth of religion of culture getting benefit freedom everywhere those countries are darul islam means countries of peace so particularly the muslims of this world neither any individual or organization has a right to declare any act as jihad or wage war or number 2 the whole world under you and no according to the injunctions of quran and the sunnah of holy prophets teaching whole world has become darul ahad similar to darul islam or directly the board of peace so nobody has a right to fight against anyone unless you and no decides or the state decides as a defensive war matter between state to state and these are the things and or resistance collective resistance against an oppression so these are the basic concepts which were misunderstood misinterpreted and hijacked by the terrorist we need to be clear on this concept so i have tried to convey my message of peace and message of counter terrorism and uh, clarification of the concept of islam and reclaiming the terms back from the terrorist back to islam i hope uh, almighty god will help us in understanding more and more each other thank you wassalam thank you very much
Thank you very much. Uh, if we're here now at the question and answer uh, session, so if you can just uh, align, take, um, align yourself to, we have a mic on the left side and on the right side, and when you um, have a question, just if you could just identify yourself, and if you have an affiliation, that would be helpful too. We'll start with uh, my left or your right first. Yes, thank you very much, Sheikh. That was uh, very inspirational. Uh, I'm Steve Sawmill. I coordinate an interfaith group in the D.C. area. And uh, I'd like to ask you a two-part question. In Israel-Palestine, the Palestinians have no state, no recognized state. Yet they're occupied, and I'm wondering what your advice to Palestinians would be who feel so oppressed. Uh, what recourse do they have? Because from your definition, they do not have recourse to jihad. Um, secondly, uh, in the New York Times today, it's reported that uh, the Palestinian negoti negotiator, Arakat, is saying that with the settlement renewal, that he feels they should go to the United Nations to be recognized as a state, the Palestinians. Yet this article also says that the Arab states... America and the Arab states advise against doing that. And I'd like to know your opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Answering the second question first, I will endorse this recommendation that they should go to United States, uh, United Nations, to be recognized by the state, uh, by United Nations as a state, so that they may get the uh, lawful rights and privileges according to... Uh, to the United Nations Charters. Secondly, <clears throat> even if uh, there is no state, for example, to exercise the right of jihad in the form of self-defense, even then what is happening? Even then, in any case, the worst comes to worst. No one is allowed to commit suicide bombing against civilian population, whether they are Israelites or they are Americans, they are British or they are Europeans. Nobody is allowed to commit suicide bombing on non-combatant civilians. Nobody is allowed to commit terroristic acts on civilian population because this act was prohibited even during warfare, as I already explained. So the, what, the acts which were being taken up and given the name of jihad, itself they are crimes according to Islamic teachings. They should raise their voice politically, peacefully, they should use the peaceful, political, constitutional, international means and ways through the Arab states, Islamic state, through the United, uh, through the UNO, and whatever is possible they can do. But if there are, for example, two states, when Israel or any other state, neighboring state, fight with each other, so militaries have always the right to fight each other or whatever they do on the battlefield. Not the organizations, they are not allowed they, they, can, they can get recruited in the army. They can get recruited in the military properly, and they should fight as military men against the militaries in the battlefield. But killing the Jewish community or killing the Christian community or killing the Muslim community or the human communities, those who are non-combatants and those who are civilians, this is absolutely not allowed in any circumstance. Thank you. But the, but the lawful defense... Not, not the not killing of non-combat combatants, but lawful defense. You're saying Palestinians could join an army. What, what no, are you saying about specifically the No, no. The if they want to do, they they would have become a proper part of the army, joined and proper part of an army, so that they may, as a military, proper military as recruitment, so that they may do whatever they want to do in a proper according to a state. If state announces a war, then they would be a part of the army of a particular state if certain state allowed. And if they want to do something on their own, so this is not allowed, then they have to act upon the conduct of Prophet, peace be upon him, which he adopted for in the first 14 years of Mecca. Same situation was there. There were a lot many Muslims in Mecca who did not migrate along with him to Medina. They were inhabitants in, in, in Mecca. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, they were being killed. There were act of persecution and cruelty and killings were being committed against them. Everything was being done. Quran mentioned in Surah An-Nisa, 
فمالکم لا تقاتلون فی سبیل الله والمستد عفین من الرجال والنساء والولدان الذين يقولون ربنا اخرجنا من هذه القريه الظالم اهلها the whole situation has been prescribed in surah an nisa but even these 13 days everything was being done but none of the companions took arm against the civilian population of mecca neither holy prophet allowed any group to go and take revenge because they are killing our muslim brothers in mecca so this was always this step was taken as a self defense or against the aggression by the state now the situation is changed since the end international treaty has been done through you and know the best way is to come politically to use their constitutional right to talk of human rights come to you and know and develop their political pressure as a community through the states through the world voice they should bring their voice up so that united nations through the proper constitutional international law means they should take certain steps in any case whatever happens worst comes to us no organization or group is allowed to take up arms and kill the non combatants or civilians thank you thank you thank you um thank you kamar um <coughs> sheikh ul islam i've had the privilege of listening to you for the third time this time so i'm going to uh, i have two questions which are interlinked but before i mention the questions uh, let me compliment you on this uh, a combination of this and uh, this articulation which is very spirited combined with the logic which is irrefutable i think that combination is rare and please accept my heartfelt thank com- thank compliments for much. that thank you very much um my question <coughs> is uh, you know you when you lay down the principles the conditions under which self defense defensive warfare can be conducted there are very very i mean very high principles involved apart from the very obvious of not killing women children old men and so forth and priests and and and, and yeah. protecting churches and so <coughs> forth they are also protecting the environment as i hear you you know trees animals yeah, yeah, and so yeah. forth um one as a matter of curiosity to what extent did the geneva convention and the new charters actually derive from some of the islamic principles as laid out in the quran 1400 years ago number one uh, my second question which is linked to this is about the kharijites it's extremely intriguing because the projection or the rather the uh, the proclamation that this will occur ag- again and again until yeah. the antichrist comes along um is is and the definitions given and the kind of people they're going to be seems to be pretty much identical to what's going on today now i am a retired uh, director of operations of the world bank so my own uh, bent is towards the development side uh, rather than the destructive side of yeah. of uh, reconciliation if you like Uh, something which all parties talk about but i think very insufficient uh, action is taken in that regard is there any injunction given the fact that a lot of the recruitment the taliban and the other people um is on the basis of people coming from marginal areas poverty lack of voice and so forth deprived of something or the other to un- under which they turn towards uh, these extreme practices of the kharijites uh, is there something in the quran which says how we can change the hearts and minds before these people actually make the change uh, to yes. these directions thank you thank you very much <clears throat> again answering your second question first because i forgot what your what first question was <laughs> then when i finish the answer then i'll ask again briefly so no I, no no just you can give me a hint so there is definitely a positive injunction in holy quran and in prophet sunnah to change their hearts and minds so that they may uh, get rid of this uh, criminalistic or terroristic activities and they may think toward the developmental aspect to win their hearts the quranic verse which refers to muallafatul qulub the verse of sadaqat the verse of charity a specific uh, portion was fixed for winning the hearts of the people so that their mindset are ch- is changed muallafatul qulub it continued so the money was spent on them <clears throat> to take them away from poverty and the the baitul mal it was ordained by the holy prophet and the caliphate that baitul mal was open for jews and non muslim and christians so that they also get the economic support not only the muslims muslims of course definitely but even non muslim so that they are supported socially and economically they are upgraded their economic deadlock is resolved 
<clears throat> they feel happy in a society, respectable place. They can gain respectable place. And that's why how through the social reforms, educating them, providing them economic necessities, upgrading them, their status, this is how you change their mindset and win their hearts. This is the Quran. And same was the practice of Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. You know, even in those days when Makkah was at war, but Makkah was not in the state of uh, treaty, it was in state of war, and always planning fights and wars against Medina. Even in those days, once there was uh, a big uh, kahat, um, a famine, very big, and it was reported to Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, Holy Prophet, two events, he sent a lot of uh, gold and coins and gold to Mecca and ordered Abu Sufyan to distribute this among the poor. And he is distributing this among the poor of a state at war. And second time, he sent the money and to ask Abu Sufyan and one another leader of Mecca. And he refused to receive and Abu Sufyan received it. And they distributed it among the poor of Meccans, non-believers and mushrikeen Meccans. They were distributed. Third time again the same thing happened and Abu Sufyan came to Holy Prophet and he raised his hands and made supplication to Almighty Allah so that Almighty Allah brings rains, gives rains to them and provides them economic prosperity. So the best way is to provide economic prosperity, to provide them education, to take them out of the poverty, to remove poverty alleviation. Act of charity was done for them. So these things are necessarily required and these are the answers for today too. One is the military way of uh, terminating them. But the other way is this through social reform, providing them facilities. This was what happened in war of Afghanistan initially when it was known as jihad. When the, the Afghans were fighting against the Russian occupation. After 10, 11 years war when everything was finished and Russia was defeated. Everybody who, who put all these people in Afghan war, they came back. And these people who were trained for 14 years to fight Russia, they were left on their own. So there were no infrastructure, no education, no economic support, no social support. Uh, U.S. came back and Saudi Arabia came back and Pakistan came back. And I, see, I say all these three great muftis of the world who declared jihad, the war of Afghanistan, the U.S., Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, all together in many countries. Of course, the, the Afghans were fighting the war of, defend, war of independence. But when it was fought, everybody, the mistake committed by U.S. and all other uh, partners of the Western countries and Muslim countries together was everybody left Afghanistan. And those people were left, nothing to do. They were neither engineers, nor doctors, no infrastructure, no money, no jobs, nothing. Finally, what were they supposed to become? Finally, they were just supposed to become terrorists. They took up arms and started fighting in Kashmir. When those borders was blocked for them, then they started fighting in Pakistan. They became sectarian terrorists. And when sectarian terrorism was a little bit curtailed, then they started fighting in those particular areas where up till today the war of terror is going on. So we have seen the results of not attending them, uh, providing them social things. And so. so this is the way given by Quran and the Sunnah of Holy Prophet. What was your first time? What about the UN Charter, the Geneva Convention? Yes, yes. I would say whatever UN Charter has given on the subject of war and peacemaking, and Geneva Convention, whatever it has been given on the US uh, on the peacemaking, even the res Security Council resolutions, when they were passed in 1990, then 1992, in case of Kosovo, when there was a permission was given for collective interference against the abuse of human rights. All these developments up till today on the subject of war and peacemaking, to me, as a humble student of Islam and classical sciences and Islamic law, they are absolutely in consonance with Quranic teachings and Islamic teachings. I don't find any conflict in UN Charter and Geneva Convention. I won't say like this, that they have derived this from Quran and Sunnah. No, this would be not fair to say but this is a development of collective conscience of humanity. Collective conscience of the countries. They keep on... Whole world was in the state of war. There were centuries. Not only Muslim world, the Christian world was also... The issues were resolved through wars. This was the common international practice. 
issues, even the pagan society up till the medieval period, the issues, the conflicts were resolved through wars and fights. But the time realized before the First World War, at the First World War and the, the League of Nations, that a time has come that we should try to resolve the disputes through peacemaking efforts and through dialogue and through communication. And United Nations finally came into existence. Of, so this is a collective development of communities. But this is a chance that whatever is the result of collective development of communities is the same what was injunction given, uh, what was educated and what was constructed, what was instructed and what was revealed by Quran and Holy Prophet 1400 years before. There's no conflict between the two. Thank you. Yes, you have a question. Uh, thank you. Um, my, my name is uh, Irfan Malik. Uh, I'm with Pakistan American Public Affairs Committee. And I want to thank uh, Sheikh for coming, visiting us in Washington, D.C., and, uh, and I pray and hope you can visit us more often. Thank you. Um, I first uh, came to know of your work when Christiana Manpur interviewed you, oh, and God. ever since, um, you know, I've been following your work, and yes, I yes. hope and pray that they are more like you. My question is uh, radicalization of the youth. I think uh, that, that's really the area of concern for Muslim Americans over here and probably uh, for Muslims uh, living in Europe as well. And, and I wanted to know if uh, your organization, Minhajul Quran, or any other organization have uh, programs for the youth where we can go or have messages uh, that can be given to the youth through local imams, through their parents, or through the community leaders. And, um, and, you know, if any of these programs either exist yes, yes. in USA or in Europe or in Lahore, yeah, yeah, yeah. where you have your facility. Thank you very much. It's a very important question, please. As far as other organizations are concerned, you can find out their activities, what kind of programs they are running. They would be better in giving the answer and details. As far as the Minhajul Quran organization, our organization is concerned, we have programmed. And there is multi-dimensional programs going on on de-radicalization. <clears throat> One of the major uh, event, part of the regular program, ongoing program is Al-Hidayah, which takes place every year in England, in Warwick University. And next coming year in September, there is going to be a gathering of about 15 to 20,000 youth in London, Wembley Hall. On, probably in, anywhere in some day in September, you will know through the internet just on de-radicalization. And I arrange a camp of, uh, for the youth, a four days camp. I stay there day and night and deliver my lectures eight hours a day, four hours with question and answer in the morning, four hours with question and answer in the evening, and then every single day, two to three scholars for their talks. They are also invited from Arab world and English world. So this is a four-day continuous camp, one thing. Then through literature. We are trying to de-radicalize the youth. This is a very big de-radicalization camp. I think youth are, uh, they, would, they, they will feel, when they come only they can feel what they are receiving from here. Second big step which we have taken, that is an establishing of a university. We have finished the, you can say, dichotomy of the religious and secular education according to the old Islamic educational system. We have abolished madrasa systems. We have taken the steps. Although I have established, by, by the grace of God, one university which is chartered by the government of Pakistan includes all disciplines, religious, spiritual, social sciences, and human sciences, chemistry, and, 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 and economics, and physics, and mathematics, and managerial sciences, and, and computer sciences, all relevant subjects as other universities with full-fledged disciplines you find. And there we, we are concentrating on the religious sciences and spiritual sciences too as a combined discipline. The youth, they st get up for tahajjud. They, re they live with wudu, with evolution. They have a very specific code of moral code of conduct. And then they have their training camps for youth, male and for females. Sometimes one week camp we organize in Pakistan and in other countries too. Sometimes 15 days camp, sometimes one month camp just to de-radicalize youth and spiritualize the youth. When I talk of de-radicalization, I talk on three sides. Intellectual aspect, 
the practical aspect and spiritual aspect. So we, we, we work on all three dimensions. So annually there is another program of Etekaf under Minhajul Quran where 50 to 60,000 Muslims and 90% or 80% out of them are youth. 50, 60,000 Muslims stay with me for 10 days, days and night in Etekaf, you know, last 10 days of Ramadan. And I deliver my training speech after Salat to Tarawi to Tahajjud 5 to 6 hours every night. Then there is a 24-hour schedule, full-fledged schedule for 10 days. They, they get education, they get uh, properly motivated, then they go with this message out there. In the same way, we have established halakat of zikr, halakat of fikr, and halakat of salutations, darud, so that we may spiritualize the people and take them away from extremistic tendencies. Then we have programs of literature, dozens and many books on this kind of subject. As I mentioned, I've written Khilafa and Democracy, small chapters and a big book, in the way Ijtihad, Perception and Reality, this fatwa, human rights, non-Muslim rights. Interfaith. Then we have established a big program of interfaith dialogue, where the, I mentioned, I think here, mm-hmm. yeah, or in the office, I think. In office, yes. where, where the Christians, delegates come every year to Minhajul Quran and break their fast. And we arrange dinner for them in the last fast of their, their religion. And our mosque is open for the Christian delegates to pray according to, to worship according to their faith. So we have set a model. And we have a close interaction between the, our mosques, Minajul Quran and centers, and churches and temples. They come to us, our people go there, and we have joint sessions and joint walks and joint seminars. There are many other, and particularly for in here, we have online programs. Online program of teaching of Quran and teaching of Islamic studies. And there is a program, online scholar, scholar online. I think it is weekly. Yes. Dr. Weekly scholar online. So the people can join. They are arranging in Texas in various states of the U.S. So people sit there and they give the subjects whatever they need. And with full preparation, one scholar, either from Pakistan or from England, or from other countries, they deliver their talks and question answers to educate the people. So, according to the timings of those countries, 24-hour various programs are running online. So, alhamdulillah, there are quite a few dozens of very humble efforts which we are trying to do to de-radicalize the youth. I hope, inshallah, our humble efforts and efforts of all other organizations that people will bring good results. Thank you very much. Do, do, do you have any plan to introduce these programs in USA, especially the youth camps? And It can be done. The youth camps can be done if uh, uh, some people organize. So the uh, youth camp can be, can, can be done in USA. It can be done, three days youth camp. If some people come up, come out, and they take responsibility of organizing, so the same kind of camp for 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 youth can be uh, arranged in U.S. too. It would be good. De-radicalization camp right. in U.S. matter. Thank you very much. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, first, let me thank you for this exceedingly thoughtful and informative uh, discussion here today. It's, it's, I think it's been helpful for everyone here in the room. Uh, my you. name is uh, David Hunsaker, and I'm from U.S. Um, the United States Agency for International Development, and I work in the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation there. And, and my question um, is focused on the, the, the substance of what uh, you uh, presented here today and what you present in, in, in the 600-page fatwa demonstrates the unanimity with which mainstream Islamic scholars mm-hmm. and the mainstream Islamic community has viewed um, the use of violence, its, its limits, and uh, when it's permissible, when it's not permissible. And given this unanimity over 1,400 years in terms of how these things have been understood, what is it today that has allowed for these concepts to be hijacked? And what needs to be done beyond simply issuing a fatwa uh, that basically draws from all of these traditions. I mean, looking through your fatwa, you know, I see that you're not just drawing on one tradition, you're, you're drawing on the, uh, the interpretations of the Hadith scholars, you're, um, uh, not just Hanafi scholars, uh, Shafi scholars, others. Yeah, yeah. 
And what needs to be done to uh, take this a step further to empower uh, scholars to get this message that has been agreed upon for so long out to uh, a broader audience and, and be more broadly implemented in order to take back uh, the dialogue? Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Thank you. The actual text of fatwa has yet to come for you to study. Whatever you have seen, that is the brief summary. I, I looked briefly at the Urdu the version. Urdu one, the one, Arabic, Arabic I understand text. the Arabic enough that uh, yes, <laughs> I can Arabic pick out text. the pieces. But this is under print. It is under print, and yeah. I hope next month the whole full Arabic, t- English text of fatwa would be in your hands. And the Arabic text will also be, inshallah, in your hands the next two months. I agree with the, your analysis. The only problem is what we are supposed to do, that the activists, the terrorists extremists, the radicals, they are always active. That's why they are activists. And the mainstream Islam, the Muslim scholars, they are always silent because they are peaceful. And the peace is never active. It remains inactive, silent, dormant. So the majority of Muslim ummah, they have isolated themselves from ongoing problems of the society. We need to activate them so that their voice becomes vocal, their voice becomes loud, they are heard, and they should stand up collectively and actively to condemn that all these activities being done by a very handful of terrorist terrorist people, there is not Islam, which as I have explained and other authorities have been saying, and scholars, they need to be vocal and loud. Major role... I have been saying the same thing for the last uh, 30 years, but I was also unheard. This is not a new thing which I have said. I wrote more than 15 books on these subjects from early 19 to last year. Five, six, seven books on human rights, different non-Muslim rights, children's rights, women rights, common human rights, animal rights, on subjects, non-violence, interfaith, harmony, all these things. Then, I, as I mentioned, khilafah and democracy, and these subjects. But I was also unheard. This was just fortunate that when I issued this fatwa, maybe because of the, this term, or a very clear-cut, categorical, absolute condemnation of terrorism, without any if and but, and without conditionality, it was picked up and the whole Western media received it very nicely. And I am thankful, thankful for that because they made it popular. And this voice then approached everywhere and people started thinking, you know, whatever we have been listening from that side, not is, that is not Islam, there is something else. So the only basic thing is we have to propagate. Thousands of websites are being run by activists, radicals, terrorists, and extremists. And there may be very few websites being run by the mainstream Muslims, scholars, talking of peace, moderation, compassion, mercy, love, brotherhood, and integration. So we have to run more and more websites so that that this voice be heard. These messages are conveyed so we have, alhamdulillah, put all everything on the websites. We are making small 10 minutes shorts of talks and speech. We are arranging seminars. We are arranging workshops on these subjects. So we need workshops on these subjects. We need more integration. We need more propagation. We need to be more active and uh, to make this voice be heard all over the world so that the Western and Eastern people may understand that certain person or certain organization they are not, these are authorities nor representatives of Islam. This is Islam. And they hijack this term because they create news and views. Nuisance. They, nuisance always create news. And peaceful people, since they remain silent, they never create news. So you have to speak loudly, speak up loudly, so that your voice is heard everywhere and you are properly represented. The only way is being active. I think we're, we have a lot from you, and, um, and we are just a little before um, four o'clock. There's one uh, one question I have before we um, break, which is within your fatwa, 
um, there's a question of whether you're calling the Khawarij the contemporary terrorist, uh, kufr, dis unbelievers? Yes, yes, yes. This is Are you calling them non-Muslims, disbelievers, um, or transgressors? Could you elaborate that? Because this is a, a bone of contention from those who, who read this fatwa in the original Urdu. And, and, um, and then the abridged version in English is, has, has tried to do some justice. But could you, are you calling the contemporary yes. terrorist and all those organizations that we identify, Al-Qaeda, Lashkar, Taliban, so so forth, so forth, um, and all these other, are you saying they are disbelievers or non-Muslims? What is their status in, in, in this regarding is very, your fatwa? This, this is very important question. Very okay. interesting. I saved it for last. I'm thankful <laughs> to you that you put this <laughs> question to me. The thing is that uh, we have to understand this uh, topic jurisprudentially and exegetically, according to the ex exegetical principles of Quran and jurisprudential principles of Islamic law. What I have said in this fatwa and what I am saying, what I consider is that killing of human beings, it possesses two kinds of status. This act possesses two kinds of status or two kinds of position. There are two positions. One is just an act of killing. There are not many murderers who kill any innocent people out of anger, the tribes, the people, the families, they kill. They kill by mistake, they kill by un unintentionally, they kill intentionally. So just an act of killing. First of all, Quran says, "Man qatala nafsan bi ghairi nafsin wa fasadin fil ard, fakannama qatala nasa jamia." If anybody kills any person, no <coughs> qualification of being Muslim, no condition. Any person may be Muslim or non-Muslim. The word nafsan means any person, Muslim or non-Muslim. If anybody kills him or her, then he will be considered as if he has killed the whole of humanity. This is the first basic article from which I am deriving. <clears throat> now, the act of killing has two positions, legally speaking. One is just an act of killing, without any particular ideology or theology. So this act of killing is known as haram, forbidden. So any killer... He is a criminal, he is committing a haram act, a forbidden and forbidden act. Second position of act of killing is under a particular ideology. To kill a person or to kill a community or to kill a group of persons, either by suicide bombings or by terroristic attack in any way. To kill certain people, Muslim or non-Muslim, with an intention, with a faith, with an ideology that this killing is lawful. The first killer is killing a, a man, but he thinks that I am doing it. He knows that he is do, committing a crime. That is haram, unlawful, forbidden. But the second category is that if somebody or some people do the same act of killing with an ideology that this act is lawful or we are under an obligation to kill them, or this act of killing it would take us to heavens mm. instead of taking us to hellfire. We are going to heaven and getting 70 virgins. And if we are killed in suicide bombing, then we are martyrs. So with this whole mindset and ideology, if somebody kills, he becomes a kafir. A non-believer. He becomes a disbeliever. Disbeliever. He becomes a disbeliever. So this is not only stated by me, this is an agreed upon exegetical and jurisprudential principles quoted by the scholars and all exegetical specialists. And the first reference which I will quote here, I mentioned, is Imam Abu Mansur al-Maturidi, mm -hmm. the Imam of Ahlu Sunnah in 3rd century, who organized and compiled the, the science of Aqidah, science of theology. He has categorically written in his Ta'wilatu Ahl Sunnah in his book of Tafsir that manistahalla dima al nas or dima al muslimin or dima al nas the one who istihlalud dima bloodshed 
is one thing and bloodshed and considering it that it is halal, it is permissible or obligatory, he said, Fakad kafara. He becomes a disbeliever. Since the Kharijites, what, what would we say? A very specific term which we, we would follow the term used by Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Holy Prophet ﷺ did not say that those Kharijites, because of these acts, they, be, they would become kafir. He didn't use the word kafir. He said, Yamrukuna minaddine kama yamruku sahmu minar ramiya. They said, they will go out of the ambit of Islam. They will go out of the ambit, out of the cycle of Islam. They will go out of my ummah. So they would have no link with Islam and no link with my ummah. And they would be liable to death punishment. And the people who will terminate them and fight them, those terrorists, he will get the reward as if he fought the nation of Ad and Samud. So here, we will use the, the term we use by Holy Prophet that they are out of the ambit of Islam. They are not Muslims. We would say they are not Muslims. They are out of the ambit of Islam. We will use the terms used by Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the fourth aspect, there were two views among the jurists and muhaddisin and scholars. Two views. I have given the full summary here. Some scholars, all of the scholars and jurists agree upon the termination or the capital punishment or termination of the Kharijai terrorists. None of them has given any degree less than capital punishment for a terrorist, Kharijai terrorist. This is a unanimous from in all schools of law and muhaddisin and mufassirin, the specialist authorities of hadith and authorities of tafsir, exegesis. But there were two views. What would we say them? Whether they would be kafirs or they would be known as bughat, the rebels. Although they are liable to, be, liable to be terminated, but what would be their title? Majority of Islamic scholars, including Imam Bukhari and, and Imam Ajuri and Kazi Ayaz and Imam Nawawi and Imam Asqalani and Imam Ghazali, all these scholars up till present time, majority, overwhelming majority, they have been declaring their act kufr. And there were very few scholars among the muhaddisin and very few scholars who have declared them bughat, rebels. Instead of saying them disbelievers, they said they are liable to be desperate punishment and to be terminated. But their title, technical title would be like bughat, they are rebels. Like rebels are liable to be terminated, liable to be fought with. That's why they, are, they would be technically known as rebels, al bughat and majority have been saying that they go out of the ambit of Islam and they have declared their, their act as kufr, but as community they are not said that they are kufar. Their act is kufr and they, the act is act of disbelief and they become disbelievers according to the commandments of Holy Prophet. But as community we say they are no, not Muslims. These are the limitations combining both views, but majority go to their kufr. Very few scholars hear them the Bukhat and rebels. Thank you. Oh, there's a follow up? <laughs> okay. It's a follow up to the final question. Can you come use the microphone so we can hear you appropriately? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that very important clarification. Thank you. And uh, I thank you for your prior remarks. Um, in the Western media, the characterization of the group of terrorists that you describe is usually Islamist, Islamic extremists. It still makes them sound, makes it sound mm -hmm. as though they are in the ambit yes. of the prophet's community. Yes, yes, yes. So if you were to use English words to describe such people and for our own use in describing them, what would your recommendation yes. my, be? My thought has been to say that they are pseudo-Islamists. They are pretend or fake Islamists, yes. Muslims. But. I agree with your view. I won't say them Islamists. This is a wrong term. And this, is legit this term legitimizes their activity. Right. Saying them Islamists or Islamic terrorists, this legitimizes them. 
and this provides them a, an Islamic foundation, an Islamic uh, uh, legitimacy. The world Islam in any form, Islamic or Islamist, should be removed from them. The terrorists have no religion. They should be just known as terrorists, criminals, killers, enemies of humankind. So that the world terrorist is more than enough. When you bracket it with Islamist or Islamic, they gain many sympathies from a lot of uh, youth who are accessible to be radicalized. So they, they, are, they gain a lot of sympathizers. Then they become jihadis. So this is the Western media by giving the term Islamist, uh, connecting this term to them. In fact, this helps them, provides them strength. So I think this world Islam should be totally removed from them. As if there is any terrorist in H India, we never say Hindu terrorist. If there is anyone in Christian world, we never say Christian terrorist. We never say Jewish terrorist. Because Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, all religions, Bible, Holy Quran, and no religion, no holy book teaches extremism or terrorism. Every religion has come here for peace. So we have to remove every kind of religious title with them. No connection of Islamist and Islamic, just terrorist, so that they may be known as criminals, unanimously known as criminals for the whole of mankind. And terrorist is sufficient. This is my recommendation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you.